thank you for joining us once again. Today, my very special guest is Dr. Eric Westman, who is um, fairly well renowned around the place as an expert in two or more fields, which is quite a rare thing. And I thought it would be really good to get Eric on and talk to him about his views on one or two things, precisely for that reason, because it's quite rare that you have someone who is expert both in the medical field and also in the field of research science. Um, so I can stop talking now pretty much. And, and Eric, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a bit about your background, your particular expertise and what, you know, where you come, how you come to your, your current sort of position on human nutrition a bit. Yeah, well, I guess the culmination of, of the recent work I've done is I have a vanity license plate you can purchase these it says keto doc k-e-t-o-d-o-c so i'm known as the doctor who prescribes the keto diet and we have a keto medicine clinic at duke university but I, starting gosh some time ago i trained as an internal medicine physician at the university of wisconsin in madison which is a state university and the university of kentucky uh, which is another state university, and then ended up at Duke University for training in a fellowship program that really let learn. Uh, I learned how to do clinical trials, clinical research at Duke University, which is a private university in the southern U.S. Um, turned out that Duke University was well known for something called the rice diet. The rice diet was a program where you would come and you would eat rice and fruit and fish and you'd lose a lot of weight because the calories were super low. And there was a flamboyant doctor who got, uh, you know, um, in trouble for maybe allegedly, you know, threatening patients, things like that. But the people who come to that little old Durham, North Carolina, where Duke is, to lose weight. And, and so in the mid-90s, when I'm in clinical research training, I was curious about things that affected my patients in the clinic and losing weight was clearly one of them. And I had no training in this. So I went to visit that clinic and I went to visit another clinic for weight loss and all that. And then two of my patients in my own clinical practice at the VA Veterans Affairs Hospital Clinic, which is uh, really kind of the largest group health um, uh, clinic and hospital system in the US. Uh, two of my patients did the Atkins diet I didn't know what it was, and, and they lost over 50 pounds. And, and I, again, I was just kind of curious. And one thing led to another. I, I was in Dr. Atkins' office because he invited me up to look at what they did. And then I asked him for research money. And we started, our first paper was published in 2002. And we kept publishing research. So basically, I, I transitioned from an internal medicine doctor to one who prescribes medicines to an obesity medicine and keto doctor. And what I do now is I take away medicines that my colleagues prescribe. Um, so I, so I, I've always been human centric. I, I'm very kind of chauvinistic and human centric about this. I really don't care about research in mice and rats. And, and you know, you get a lot of money doing that and, and you can find some things that really do work, but sometimes you go down, <laughs> pun intended, rabbit holes and you don't find anything relevant to, to humans. So I'm a very human centric. In fact, I require before I make a, a, a policy decision for my patients, I require a high level of evidence, meaning multiple randomized controlled trials by different groups, hopefully by groups who are trying to show that it was bad and they find that it showed that it was good. And that's really what's happened with the low carb keto diet through the years. All these people tried to do studies to show it was bad it wasn't bad, but you see, they weren't trying to find something that worked. Their agenda was to show that it was bad and because it wasn't bad, they never did the second study. <laughs> so we have all of these one studies, low carb versus low fat, one carb, low, but they all show that, you know, low carb is superior in terms of weight loss and diabetes reversal and all that. And, and so I'm happy and I'm proud to be a part of that early research that kind of started the wheels changing or the pendulum shifting, if you will, from fear of fat in the food to a, you know, a science-based fear or not fear, but um, idea that sugar and carbs 
really are the things that need to be monitored and restricted. So in the literature, our research uh, is called carbohydrate restriction instead of fat restriction and the implementation of it. Now, I, I was in a busy practice today where someone flew in from, from another state just for an hour uh, to, and then went back to the airport. And, and then I get someone who's born and raised in Durham and, and went through the, the eighth grade doesn't really understand, you know, so I get a wide range of people to teach about it. And um, it's so effective. You don't even have to do it right. And it can work. <laughs> so that's kind of the role I find myself in now is making, trying to get people to relax about all of the keto police. And, you know, you have to worry about that carblet, you know, the, the microgram of carbs and the, the, that's coating the cheese. I mean, you know, come on. It, we're talking grams of carbs, and and um, so it's actually been interesting because I just followed information, but I, I kind of cheated in terms of visiting doctors who had used this because I didn't make it up. And in fact, when you talk to the doctors who started using this in the 1970s, Dr. Atkins, Dr. Ease, they read about it in the medical literature, and it really goes back to the Banting diet in the 1860s. And then, you know, you look at the Osler textbook of medicine from a hundred years ago, the textbook that taught doctors what to do, it used a low carb diet to treat diabetes a hundred years ago. And, and now, uh, we, you know, drugs are the, the treatment of the day for medical doctors. And um, I, I take away the drugs and people are getting better just by changing the food. In fact, I had a relative come to town uh, to just shadow what I was doing and also curious about Duke and and my my niece you know said you know geez Uncle Eric all you do is tell people not to eat carbs and you get paid for it yeah I said you know yeah it's a pretty good gig isn't it and you know um, because so many people don't believe it can happen or uh, it, it really is so simple it's hard to believe so so I have an open door policy if someone's medically trained and wants to learn about it, you come on to my clinic in North Carolina, you know, we set up a time and you can shadow me. I, I, there's a new group of doctors now who uh, have no fear about fat. You know, they just kind of turned the page on that. I had a group, uh, a doctor and his dietitian uh, who came from Texas to visit me. And oh my gosh, they're, they're thinking way beyond where I am because they, they're starting with a clean slate of not being defensive or, or having fear about what they were taught. And uh, so I'm really excited about the, the doctors that are gonna be using this. And I mean, one of the fortresses that really hard to scale is how do you, how do you address the guidelines and how do you address pediatric, the children? Uh, and, and this, you know, it's out of my, my scope because I'm an adult medical doctor, but that old analogy of uh, you can work really hard as a doctor or, or as a relief worker and pull people out of the river. You're working, you're saving lives, you're saving lives. The, the, the intelligent doctor or the, the, you know, who wants to really have impact walks upstream, you know, the relief worker and stops people from jumping in the river, right? So the, the new kind of ne next level of of research and, and advocacy needs to be stopping the carbs from going in the, the human bodies earlier in life, you know, and, and that now we're learning it even begins with, with maternity. If the mother is eating carbs, the, the baby is bathed in insulin and, and, and maybe even getting the sweet tooth sugar addiction started when they're in utero. I mean, you know, so, uh, so anyway, in, in a world without carbs, there's no obesity. There's no diabetes. There, there, I wonder if there might not even be these things like lupus or, or irritable, not irritable involves them I can fix, but ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. There's a pretty strong signal that it's something in that ultra processed food carb mix. I don't know exactly what, but um, so I've really kind of focused on using this nutritional ketosis idea, carb restriction, uh, to treat medical illness. And, and and I'm not really into prevention and, and pediatrics, but I want other people to be in that area. Uh, but I guess I've seen 
uh, an area go from everyone knew it would be bad and, and doctors were vilified for doing it to now those who've kept up with the science at least accept it as a legitimate thing to do to help people, which this is kind of cool. I, I didn't think it would take 20 years to accomplish such a thing, but um, you know, they, they say the startup company, the overnight success has been there for 10 years or more. You know, so it, 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 it takes time for things to change. And um, I, I'm a, a teacher now, you know, and that's what doctor really means, teacher. And I'm helping other people write papers, actually. I'm a guest editor for a, a journal where we can help people publish their information. Um, so some people have done their own N of one trials and have blogs about them. And for example, Sam Feltham did his own trial of over consumption of calories and he, he didn't know how to publish a paper. So I said, Hey Sam, you know, get your information together. We'll, we'll get it published as a, at least here, the straw man. So in Sam's body, <laughs> He, he gained weight on a keto diet at 5,000 calories a day or so, but he didn't gain as much as when he was eating a high carb, five, same calorie level, but different you know, hormonal effects of the calories. And uh, I use that as kind of the straw man of, of prove, prove this is wrong. Prove that, you know, that he basically nailed in his own body an N of one trial that a calorie is not a calorie. And, and while the the NIH researchers are prattling and some bizarre, you know, you know, even changing data or saying we didn't find what we thought we would, so it didn't happen. Weirdness that uh, if you just took 10 people and did what Sam did, we'd have that answer. Calorie is not a calorie, the way it behaves inside the human body. But um, so I'm at that level where, oddly enough, I, I used to say, um, and David Sackett and McMaster used to say, if someone's only writing review papers, don't trust them. They have to be, be getting primary data. Well, I'm afraid I'm at that level where I, you can't trust me because I'm really helping you know, with review papers. However, I'm still in the clinic and I'm helping other people with primary data. Uh, but uh, I guess the other big news that I heard just recently is a major study has been funded in the US from the Department of Defense to look at the keto diet for heart failure. And I think it also includes a diet with a ketone supplementation, uh, but um, that, that is really important because doctors and health systems do follow the research and, and we can be doing lots of great things clinically, but we won't really impact the health systems uh, until that kind of research is done. And it was funny, I was at the Low Carb USA conference, now called the uh, Symposium for Metabolic Health. And I was presenting three cases of heart failure reversal from my clinic. So three anecdotes, or you call it a case series. And Steve Finney got up and announced that they were funded now to do a study with heart failure to kind of scale up the research. And he didn't know I was going to present about heart failure. I didn't know he was already funded for, for studying it. Now, being funded for something doesn't mean it, it's a done deal, right? It means it's being studied. Doesn't We don't know how many people it will help or if it will help in, in repetitive use, but I'm pretty confident after reviewing what the heart muscle uses, it basically uses fat. The heart muscle, you know, it's kind of like a, a diesel, you know, an engine that's going all the time and, and uh, you want to have a fuel source that's high in, in ATP, high in energy, and fat is the best source for that. And, and it really is kind of ironic that of all of the fields who are afraid of the dietary fat, it's cardiology, you know, it's the heart doctors. And now here, the first big funded study will be in heart failure, which is kind of the end around because it's not really addressing coronary artery disease, which is really what the cardiologists are worried about. And, and I have to say, I'm not worried about a low carb diet when it's properly done and coronary artery disease. It's because it addresses the metabolic syndrome, the, the new way to look at the, the lipid values. And um, 20 years ago, when I first was faced with the LDL elevation, I was worried. That was 20 years ago. Now I'm not. 
because I, I follow people who have elevated LDLs. I haven't studied them, but I follow them at least. And, and we typically see the HDL go up higher than every, any, you know, I see HDLs over 80 or 100 pretty typically in US units, which means that it's like twice what normal is, you know? Uh, and so that's very protective, the uh, high HDL cholesterol. But um, um, anyway, so I, I, I guess stepping back, the, the old worry about fat in the food, you know, don't, it, it really wasn't well founded. You really should be worried about too much sugar in the diet. Uh, and, if, and especially if you have diabetes, that's the big thing you want to fix. And diabetes is a condition of excess sugar in the blood. Why not target the sugar in the food? It's what they used in 1923. <laughs> I have I have that book as a as a show and tell in my office. Um, and they they explicitly say this strict diet for diabetes in 1923 is foods without sugar. <laughs> before <laughs> before the enlightenment that we that we managed to achieve from big agriculture and big pharmacology funding that enlightened us to as to our eras on the fact that the way to avoid a disease which is ostensibly elevated blood sugar by avoiding sugar was a mistake somehow. <laughs> it, makes, it makes no sense, mm. no logic. No, no, incredible. All right, fantastic stuff. So, I mean, that segues really well into question two, which was around, uh, you know, first of all, you absolutely are doing God's work by telling people not to jump into that stream, to use that analogy. I absolutely agree with you on that. The problem, obviously, is that there are many, many um, priests of the Church of Anorexia Vegana standing around in their white coats with their stethoscopes around their necks, one of whom is a cardiologist who you've already had uh, some dealings with. Um, I have to say, I watched your video where you were critiquing that uh, used car salesman by the name of Con Man Khan, and I thought you were really, really overly gentle with him. I get why. It's the whole, you know, professional front thing. I get that, and you know, professional courtesy and all of that. Um, but I, I see characters like that personally as criminally misanthropic charlatans. And I wondered, um, Eric, if you don't mind, to give us your views on the difference between science and that which we do know according to science. And that which is ideology, like Con Man yeah. Khan standing in front of a group of people saying um, heart disease is caused by fat and you need to eat a plant-based diet. And there's a pile of evidence to support me on that, Eric. A pile of evidence, says, you know, says this guy. Is he right? Is there a pile of evidence? Now, obviously, you probably know my, my background is... Um, Physiology of rest and exercise. I also have research in the areas of human nutrition, cardiovascular pathophysiology, and pure and applied statistics. But pretend I don't know any of that stuff. How do I how do I tell who's credible here? Yeah. You know, um, in a medically political world, meaning so I'm past president of a national organization of doctors who have a lot of different ways of approaching the, the same problem, the Obesity Medicine Association. And, you know, I use a low-carb diet. Someone else uses a different kind of diet. Most of them use medications. Most of them uh, uh, use uh, these programs you can sell, you know. And uh, so um, I was at a meeting once where uh, it, it wasn't Dr. Khan. It was um, uh, Joel Furman. Right, just as bad, uh, yep. <laughs> Furman, um, you know, and he, he was all excited. He was just on NPR or PBS, the public television. And, and, you know, and, you know, there are people who, you know, that you can have a, like politics, you get enough crazy people. Everyone loves you in that, right, in that area, right? Mm -hmm. So I, it, it, I remember the podium was, uh, was uh, Joel Furman, Jeff Volek. And also then Lauren Cordain, who is the uh, proponent of the paleo hunter gatherer kind of uh, uh, approach um, that um, you know has the historical uh, sort of common sense to it, right? And Jeff Volek was presenting 
So Lauren Cardain, Jeff Volek, was showing, you know, trials, eight, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, low carb, looking good and all that. And then Joel Furman really didn't show any data at all, you know. So so I, I get to the podium and I, I just, I ask all three of them to, you know, say, well, you know, you showed this, it really isn't long-term human data, you know, and you really don't have long, you know, Lauren Cordain, you don't have any data currently. And, and you know, Dr. Furman, you really didn't show any data. Furman went back to me, you know, it just took me out like with a bazooka. He's like, well, how can you say that and all that? And, and you know, I had research publications at the time. And I, I said, you know, clearly you didn't read my paper. And he just kept going on and on. Well, as this was happening, so I didn't get a chance to hear from Jeff and from Lauren. I mean, this was like a, uh, just a question, you know, you really didn't, can you just back up what you're saying, you know? And he comes after me, swinging with both arms. And, and um, finally, the, medic, the director, so I was vice president of the organization. The director of education comes forward and says, you know, Eric, just sit down. You know, it's like, well, okay, but he, he didn't answer my question. <laughs> you know, so afterwards, um, the group of the politics of the organization, the, the leaders got together and decided to bring, you know, the young Dr. Westman in. And so I'm... <laughs> The, the young Dr. Westman, I'm, I'm vice president, and they go, you know, Eric, we invited Dr. Furman to come as a as a guest, and and you get you know gave him a hard time. I said, no, I didn't. Were you there, said, Eric? It doesn't matter. We want you to write him a letter of apology. Oh hell no, hell no. Yeah, and you know what? I did. I did. Okay. And, and it's not because um, he's right. It's not, it was, it's the politics of the organization. Uh, and um, in fact, there were people then in the audience who were his like disciples who were upset with me when all I did is ask all three of the people. So, so this is, I'm just getting into the why I've stayed low in terms of giving the vegetarian, uh, what, what did you call them, the, the uh, druid? The, um, the priests of the church of anorexia vegana. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've never heard that. That's great. Um, the reason I've laid low is that they can, you know, put put a like put a stick in your bicycle wheels, and and you know I don't have a big staff, and I, I don't have lawyers and all that to to. Uh, so I've chosen to be more on the diplomatic side and just saying, well, show the data, show I mean the research, and um, um, yeah, the the Neil Barnard is another. Uh, one of these guys, and you know, it, it's interesting. They're all guys, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, or pretty much. Mm -hmm. And and then the the kind of glory movie of Forks Over Knives. It's it's like they're glorifying these men. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's very strange. Yeah, it's almost it's very cultish, and and want to di differentiate that from the low carb science, where it's not a cult. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, Neil Barnard and I were on the same podium once at a cardiology meeting and I've only met him a couple times through two times through the years I think um, he does studies of about a hundred people uh, clinical trials prospective and usually compares the approach that he uses I think vegan or vegetarian to the standard American diet which you know anything can win against that sure but then we get up and say see this diet's better than any other diet. And I'm like, but you didn't test it against low carb diets. Mm -hmm. You didn't test it against Mediterranean diet. How can you say that, you know? So, so I think one of the issues is there's a lack of accountability for what people can say. And, you know, gosh, we've gone through that over the last few years um, uh, and in politics. And um, the interesting thing, if, if there was a company that they were saying things against, they would be sued. Mm. I mean, they, I mean, they did a lawyer letter and say, uh, you know, you said something was bad, but you, that's our product, and actually, it's not bad. And you know, unless you cease and desist this, we're going to sue you. You know, because what they're saying is is libel because it's not true. Uh, and yet, in the uh, free speech kind of situation they can hem and haw and, and distract and talk about other things. And, um, uh, so, but, I, but I've learned to say things like, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of different kinds of cars. They all work. But when you get on the lot that's selling the, you know, Audis, 
they're not going to talk about Fords, you know. <laughs> so, so you get into the salesmanship of a diet, and, uh, and not even just for buying my book. It's the salesmanship for religion, and that was kind of eye-opening for me uh, when I first learned about the first um, diet uh, teaching coming from the Seventh Day Adventist Church, yeah. the Battle Creek, Michigan, the Kellogg, and the, the Corn Flakes, and and uh, Gary Fetke, Belinda's uh, Fetke, uh, they put together the really good chronicle history of Ellen White and the seizures and. I think that got into one of the recent documentaries on fat. But um, so why people are in your business saying you shouldn't eat meat is from a religious kind of prohibition of eating meat, not having to do with human health. And uh, so you have to be careful uh, now with these religious affiliations get, making money from products that are uh, plant-based. And that's kind of that big, uh, there, uh, there's a uh, like, almost like a Gordian knot of companies that are connected with with each other and making money off ultra processed food that uh, the, the best money is made when you tell people not to eat meat and to eat, you know, the impossible burger, which is, you know, the plant based burger, which you know, I won't even won't even taste. I mean, why? Why do you want? I want a real burger. You know, <laughs> I don't yeah. have a problem with eating beef. So, um, well, so then the, the nutritional epidemiologists will will argue that this very small association of red meat or processed meats in studies where they don't really assess what people eat directly, they take people's word for it, and and then you don't even measure what people eat very frequently, <laughs> and then mm. yeah, it, it, it's actually pretty amazing. There's any Thing that's found out an association at all, and and that's kind of what Walter Willett said, the doctor PhD who um, uh, wrote the book Nutritional Epidemiology. He said, "Well, those are the best associations we see with diet. You know, 1.4 to one, or you know, these are just very small yeah. uh, associations." And I, and I said, "I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Even if they're small, it's not relevant. Mm. But that's what we see is relevant. No, no." No, no, it, and even then it's hypothesis generating research. So you have this new evidence-based medicine field, which really should kind of smack the epidemiologist, you know, down and say, look, you can't be making policy. What you're doing is called uh, is hypothesis generating research. It gets us kind of in the ballpark and then we'll prospectively look and do experiments to really see if what you have found will pan out. And Frequently, these things don't pan out. It was found in associations that fiber, oh, you have to have more fiber, and then a randomized trial with sufficient power is done that shows fiber doesn't help reduce polyps or colon cancer. The low-fat diet, oh, everyone needs to lower the fat diet. You do a study with 48,000 women, one of the biggest studies ever on diet, it doesn't help with weight loss or heart disease or cancer. In fact, it might cause diabetes in a subgroup and then that's kind of just ignored. And, and um, uh, uh, the principal investigator basically got up and, and said, well, they weren't doing the diet well enough. Oh, they, they never really were doing the diet and they did it wrong. Yes, we've yeah. heard that before yeah. from, an, from theologists, haven't we? But you blame the, re the research subjects who you are supposed to teach. That's right. Right? Yeah. You were, you were in charge of teaching them. And, and so, you, and anyway. They didn't do it right. So, that means your controls were no good, which means your methodology has just been undercut by you, the principal investigator. We're done here. I know. Incredible. Uh, but so, <laughs> in a um, kind of debate format, and, and I've learned this with the media, that if there's the media always wants controversy. And, and if there's still one person out there who will, they can find, to be controversial with you, they'll find them. And then suddenly it's one to one. You know, it seems like one against the other. So I've been trying to stay out of the media because, you know, there's always gonna, you know, they're always gonna find that veggie crazy person who gets off onto the climate change and things, which is not relevant to human no. health, although mm -hmm. it might be relevant to the global health, but I don't believe it is there either. Um, but um, uh, so, there's a false comparison of, well, there's always someone. So I, 
So keeping it out of the media has actually, I think, been a good thing. And now in the U.S., there are companies making money on keto products which is a double-edged sword. If someone really needs to be on a keto diet, I say don't do those products because they're really not keto. And, and um, just because you put coconut oil or, or medium chain triglyceride into something doesn't mean it's gonna help you be in ketosis or lose weight, which is the implication. Uh, but, um, but someone has to start making money from this to stick. And then uh, hopefully the research money, research programs will start studying it and, and the, the win there really is the saving of money. There are very few things you can spend less on and actually uh, have benefits. So, so we can, with well, diabetes, for example, have money savings in terms of the uh, uh, medication mm -hmm. and dialysis down the road in coronary artery disease and do it by changing food, which is, which is orthogonal to the whole idea of medicines and all this. And, and so I don't cost the health system any, which then doesn't compute because they'll say, well, how much do we have to spend to get that result? And I said, no, 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 you don't have to spend anything. And so this is really, I guess you call it disruptive mm -hmm. technology because we're talking about food yeah. in a system that doesn't value the effect of food. The medical world just doesn't, we got no training. And yeah. sadly, that's still the same today. Is that in your area, the, the, the most medical doctors don't have training either? No, they not five minutes, most of them in their entire, uh, in their entire training. Um, I mean, yeah, what you were just saying there about talking about diet doesn't actually cost the medical industry anything. It actually does, Eric, because the allopathic medicinal industry is owned outright by Big Pharma. And if you tell people how to get off drugs, you're doing damage to them. And rightly so. That's exactly what you should be doing. So, yeah, that's that's how that one is. Um, so basically the take-home message there seems to be, and I can't disagree if I'm correct in what you're saying at all, I agree entirely, is that the only indication that is even really extant anywhere that we can look at for inference on what's likely to be good for human beings from within the nutrition science area is not science. It's epidemiology, which is a guide to actual scientists like yourself and myself to go and look for things, not in and of itself actually science, and as such, not submissible as evidence of anything. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's not experimental. Correct, so you, right. you can't know for sure. I mean, yeah. so, and then the I, when you find the first paper of something, you, you think, oh, great, mm. I'm going to wait for the second one. Yeah. So the hallmark of science is replication. Yeah. And, and so the, yeah, to do it in a, a prospective manner with, with control is going to be the only way to know. And then people say, well, we can't do research. Yeah, we can. Mm. Today we can. We have, I mean, the, the Silicon Valley approach, uh, Verda Health, which is kind of the shining low-carb keto company on the hill in, in, uh, the, in San Francisco or the Bay Area, um, showed that you can reduce, eliminate medicine through apps, through phones, through, through Bluetooth scales, through changing the food, and it's not all that expensive as a, as a treatment. Uh, and even then, that, what I do, that's kind of like Tesla car. It's like a you know, self-driving, uh, you know, state-of-the-art computerized car, their program. Me, it's more like a, a go-kart. I hand out a sheet of paper, people buy the food. You don't need a, you know, you don't need an app, you don't need a computer. And, and um, so I, I hope these organizations will see that as the kind of, okay, there's the data. Now there are other ways to do it that aren't so expensive. And, and it, it's across the digital divide. There, we have so many people who don't have computers. Uh, although in my area, it seems like everyone has a cell phone, not, not that they know how to use it, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I, I'm hopeful that there will be other ways to implement this. And, uh, but the prospective studies, I think, are necessary. You know, if you're going to say red meat is bad and you should start eliminating it from, gosh, I mean, there were cities saying we were going to ban red meat. I mean, no, you need to you know, do 
do a study in a thousand people for five years. Some get red meat, some don't. This is not going to break the bank. There was a study with 48,000 women for eight years, you know? Uh, so, um, and, and, you know, it shouldn't be the red meat industry trying to, to uh, defend itself. Mm. It should be whoever says it's bad has to prove it. Yeah. And, and that's where I am in terms of the keto low carb diet. I don't feel defensive about it anymore. I used to. And now if someone says, oh, it's bad, it's good, I said, tell me, show me the data, mm. prove it. Because I haven't seen it and I'm not aware of any studies and but it must just be yeah. kind of edges. So the, the thing for me there, Eric, is, and it's the thing I often go to when I'm engaged in elevated discussions with the folks, and it's to, to say this, we litigate science, cause and effect, this and that, empirically. Numbers. The only two things that are important are what numbers have been collected and what was the methodology used to collect those numbers. Okay. So yeah. if you say to me convergent lines of evidence, that's not numbers. If you say to me piles of irrefutable evidence, I go, that's not numbers. Show me the numbers. Of the evidence. I've heard that so much. Yeah, you go. Preponderance of evidence is another good one. Yes. Love it. Love it. Okay, they don't have any they don't have any data. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, to me, that that's the simple answer. Okay, you want to talk about cause and effect, you're making a positive claim. This causes that to occur. Show me the numbers and the methodology by which they were collected. We can talk about the numbers and the methodology of the data collection until the cows come home, if you like. Nobody wants to take me up on that discussion, Eric. They just want to tell me about their preponderance and their converging lines and their irrefutable and overwhelming evidence base. Um, yeah. but, but when you ask them to, well, let's have a look at it, um, we get sort of crickets. Well, it seems nice. <laughs> it, it took a couple of investigative journalists to really sit down and read all of the data. You know, it, that, that's Gary Taubes and Nina Teicheltz mm. and their, their books. So that you know, if if you're new to this and you, how can this possibly work? The, the, how how can this possibly be? That's my reading assignment for people at first to really get to know that the data that were collected were not solid. solid. In fact, it was weak, and, and and there were some clinical trials, but they didn't isolate out anything by the diet itself. And then the some negative studies were actually buried and not published. It only came out 10 years later, which is really, that's that's fraud. That, that's research fraud to, to be funded to do something and not to, to publish it. So, but that doesn't surprise me that the uh, people who want to just make money will make up stuff. And uh, the uh, who who holds them accountable? Well, usually there's a governmental organization and, and they were in collusion with them the whole time. Mm. So you would hope the the FDA or the USDA or some regulatory body would say, we need those numbers, like you're saying, when actually they were persuaded by lobbyists. And, yeah. and uh, that, that's kind of that tale, that story or scandal is told in these two really good books. Um, and um, it took investigative journalists to put it together, someone outside the system to be able to give that perspective, which mm. I guess kind of makes sense. Yeah. I mean, most, most um, publishing research scientists even don't actually have the wherewithal to go and look at a piece of epidemiology and look at the data set and actually critically assess the thing competently, let alone a member of the public. And, and that's one of the reasons I do what I do on my channel. Example, the Adventist Health Study 2 done by the fine, fine folks at the Loma Linda University there, where they talk about... They had five, well, they had four quartiles and a fifth group. The fifth group were their vegans. Their four quartiles were for as per the intake of red meat. And they had a separate category for processed red meat as well to make it look like they really were going to be, you know, um, discriminative, I guess, on that one. And then they collected up their data on their prospective cohort over X number of years. And they had you know, multi-million person user follow-up and everything else, and they reported 
a dose response, which was moderate. It was, you know, around about the 1.3 so-called risk ratio, which you and I both know means absolutely nothing on things of a low baseline incidence anyway. Anyway, those folks reported all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, um, cancer mortality, diabetes-related sequelae mortality, obesity-related, separated out, as well as all-cause. And they reported an increase in the incidence of death from all causes and from every sub-cause associated with every increase in quartile of meat consumption. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. And then I looked at their raw data, their incidence reports from their people that they'd been following. The data showed the exact inverse of what was reported as their, as their outcome statistic in that paper. They adjusted. Oh, right. They adjusted their statistics for this, that, and the other thing until they got a result they wanted, which was a stepwise increase in mortality. That's not what they observed. A scientist controls things um, ad hoc, collects data, and reports the observation. These so-called scientists, they're actually theologists and unapology theologists, reported a fantasy. It belongs in the fiction section. Incredible. Unbelievable. And most people, even most scientists who talk about nutrition will talk about the Loma Linda study being an indication, be it moderate at best, that eating more red meat is associated with more mortality. The study showed the exact opposite. It stuns me that there is such a degree of innumeracy, even among scientists. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, was that ever put in a letter to the editor or uh, in a rebuttal somehow? I, I did a video rebuttal because that's what I'm doing these days. I'm actually an emeritus professor these days, so I'm really not playing the game. Um, but it's probably a letter that should be written. I mean, if you want to, if you if you want to write that letter with me, let's do it. Absolutely. I, I'm game, or or even put it into a paper format. Um, to and it might be that there could be several different data sets that are looked at. Mm. Uh, uh, so I guess from a I don't know that uh, methodology. Um, well, I would be happy to look at it. That if they hadn't specified a priori. That they're going to be adjusting for all these things, that would be a violation of of every, any kind of statistical norm. Mm. You would have to have a priori, meaning beforehand, if you didn't say you were going to adjust for these things. Yeah. If, if um, the other thing is, if everyone adjusts for LDL cholesterol, yeah, which you and I know have nothing to do with heart disease, mm. <laughs> but they always put it in there. Yeah. Um, what is this going to do to bias things? And, yeah. And, um, I, I think with nutritional epidemiology, it seems to me you can torture the data or do it in enough ways that you really can see what you want to see. And so basically you're, you're going into it with an agenda to show, in this case, red meat's bad. And boy, we're going to you know, do what we can to show that. Um, you know, you would want to see that independently confirmed somewhere else uh, or, or have it, the mm -hmm. data be analyzed by an independent group. That, that's sometimes done um, if it's a very um, sensitive or, or someone's very conflicted, which I'd say they are. Yeah. So, you know, for a while, I remember pre-COVID uh, pre meeting shutdown, people would say, you know, and I have to disclose that I'm a, a meatitarian, or I have to say that I'm a keto eater. And, and the vegetarians would never disclose that they're vegetarians. Mm. They were their kind of role model that what you eat is a, is a conflict. Well, they um, do a bit, actually, Eric. They're a bit like they're a bit like CrossFitters, vegans, and cyclists. The rules are you have to tell everybody that that's you're right. You identify as part of that group within thirty seconds, or else your card is revoked if you don't make sure you mention it. So, <laughs> so of course we, we twist that around to you know you know how you know someone went to Harvard University, mm. but you just stand around them for thirty seconds and they'll they'll tell you. Yes, you could turn it into Duke. Mm. How do you know someone went to Duke? They'll just, after 30 seconds, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Excellent. All right, let's 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 segue to the to the real meat and no potatoes, because hold the potatoes. This is, this is one that's always of an interest to me when I'm talking to people 
like yourself, Eric, who you know identifies as meatarian, you're a you're a uh, a ketogenic lifestyle supporter, and I applaud that absolutely. On this channel here, we are 100% carnivore promoters. Okay, give us your thoughts. Well, how do you define carnivore? Because I, I see that there are a lot of different subgroups. Yeah. And, you know, are you, uh, you know, um, uh, lions don't drink coffee. So are you against coffee? Right. So what I what what I promote is that whatever you put into your body is your individual choice, of course. Now, I, for one, drink coffee and too much of it. So there's, a, there's an absolute disclosure. So if I have to hand my card in and say I never was a carnivore and I did it wrong, fine. I know the ramifications of coffee drinking. I have worked out the level for me that does not cause me a problem. And I know exactly yeah. where my problem starts and what those problems are. And what they are is as soon as I drink more than five of these a day, I get hypertension. Quite, quite like we're talking 35 millimeters of mercury on both ends, sort of thing. Okay, so, but so what we're saying is coffee is a toxin, coffee is a plant based product, coffee is a recreational drug. There is no place in the human diet for coffee. I'm not promoting people to drink coffee. I do, but I'm not saying you should. I'm yeah. saying you should not do that. Okay, and then is that uh, true for alcohol too? Absolutely true, and I've been guilty of that in my time as well, from time to time, drinking alcohol. That's plant-based, and it's, you know, the dietary requirement for alcohol in human beings is none. Same as carbohydrates. I teach a relaxed version of keto, mm. uh, meaning, you know, or, or they call it lazy, dirty, and, and a pejorative term because I'm not mm. super obsessive about food quality sure. um, or carblets. Um, and so I'll bring in information of, you know, alcohol seems to be helpful for certain people and, and um, stress management is something perhaps the carnivore historically didn't have to worry about, you know. So I, you know, I think um, I asked Amber O'Hearn actually to write a scholarly paper that was published in the current um, opinion of endocrinology and diabetes. I, and over the last few years, the October edition, uh, the October journal uh, month, has been guest edited by me. Mm -hmm. And I asked Amber to write a paper to, and it was in one of those uh, years. I can't remember which year, but um, she wrote a nice paper. She's given a lot of talks. So one thing I'll do, if someone's gotten a, uh, given a lot of talks and never written a scholarly article, I'll say, well, hey, why don't you put that into a paper and I'll help you if it's you know of good quality, get it published. And she did. And you know she made a good argument that you get all of the nutrients you really need as long as you're eating nose to tail, meaning not just the muscle, you know, not, not just steak, right? Um, you know, that might even be okay, but the the idea is if you're eating the awful, the, you know, the, the liver, intestine, kidney, all, you know, pancreas and all these other things, um, mm -hmm. which you get in, in the U.S. anyway, I think in the, in the sausages and, and the other uh, pate, things like that, um, uh, you probably get all the nutrients you need. Right. You know, there's no essential okay. carbohydrates. That, that's an interesting one, and yeah, I'm 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 glad that you did mention that because I could tell you from my n equals one that seven and a half years now I've consumed a ninety five percent carnivorous diet with significant periods interspersed in there of a hundred percent. I don't eat organs, entrails, ears, noses, or anuses. <laughs> so nose to tail is not an issue. I I exist on for the vast majority of the time and for months and months and months at a time on nothing but the muscle meat of largely ruminant animals and associated fat, additional butter, salt, a small amount of Greek yogurt. That's it. No deficiencies. And then I usually say to people that say, oh, yes, but if you put all that into chronometer, for example, you'll come up with all sorts of deficiencies on that diet. I usually say, great, show me the experimental evidence 
done in human beings underpinning the RDA RDIs. Go. It's, it's bad. Mm. Yeah, the, so as a comparison of, of to what an app tells you, or even what yeah. the R, uh, the DRI, or um, and what they say you should have, it, it's all kind of expert opinion mm. based on on you know animal research or or to avoid deficiency of things that you know they've seen that in the, in the world. So um, well, it, it could be that you're the only one for who this will be. I doubt that. I'm not. Possible. I'm N equals one, but there are N equals tens and hundreds of thousands of folks who are doing nothing but muscle, meat, and fat, butter, and salt. You know, it, it reminds me of the kind of absurd, ridiculous memory I have of I, I started talking to my kids' school classes, and, and uh, one time it was a middle school, meaning uh, kids were like 15 years old, and, mm -hmm. and I go in and I'm learning about diet and all that, and I did a mock crisis where, you know, oh my gosh, so there was a terrible experiment that went awry and, and in a year, all vegetables will be gone on earth, you know, mm -hmm. what are we going to do, you know, so these 30, 15 year olds put their minds together, you know, and ask great questions about health and all that. And, and it was established that you don't need to eat carbs, you know, so that's not an issue, but without the vitamins and all that, mm -hmm. and this one, Young guy gets up and says, "Dr. Westman, we should eat other people." <laughs> yeah, excellent. Because they have everything we have. They're us. Yeah. And I'm like, "Don't go home and tell your parents we talked about this." No. <laughs> this is called hmm. cannibalism. It's frowned upon, but but there are books written about how <laughs> civilization survived this way, and and um. Don't eat the, the vegans though, because you will get deficiencies from eating vegans. <laughs> well, uh, that's pretty funny. Um, but so I wonder if, um, and Finney, Steve Finney, who is one of my teachers, I think he's probably the most uh, uh, up to speed nutrition expert of our time, really, of our era, um, gave a talk once about vitamin C. And, and he, he said, you know, we really don't know what vitamin C does. You know, but if you don't have enough, this happens. And and then he started uh, talking about the the relative requirement being way different. If you, if you didn't eat carbs, you didn't need as much vitamin yep, C. Exactly. And so the the nutritional requirements will probably be very different under a carnivore sort of eating pattern. Yeah. And uh, and it's awesome that there are some GoFundMe studies now being done of surveys. I've started to see and and uh, uh, the early prospective clinical trials of carnivore. Well, well, you know they're they're going to be small and it's a start. Yeah. But at least it'll give me the the cover, the the protection to be able to talk about it mm. at an academic meeting. And that that's part of just the showmanship and the way the game is played. If you don't have studies published, you're really not supposed to bring a whole lot of uh, you know gravitas to it. It doesn't count for much. Mm. But um, I, I, if someone under my watch, you know, they, they're a patient of mine, chooses to not eat vegetables, I, I basically say, you know, I don't enforce that as part of my program. I mean, I, I recommend one cup, one fistful of a non-starchy vegetable a day, and, and then two fistfuls of leafy greens, and, and I don't really enforce that if people don't like it and, and their, their regularity is fine. You know, they have normal bowel movements, all that. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, okay, again, seven and a half years, no fiber to speak of in my diet whatsoever. I've been to the bathroom many, many times in the last seven and a half years. In fact, every morning, like clockwork, uh, not even broken into stanzas, no pushing, no straining. It's like the ice cream machine at McDonald's. So, nice fiber, fiber for bowel function? No, sir, that doesn't work either. No. So the exact dietary requirement for fiber is none at all. Well, so how did you how did you get into the carnivore idea? I started looking into the ketogenic approach when it kind of started to become rediscovered. And I say rediscovered because human beings have been living a carnivorous 
lifestyle for 350,000 years at least. Actually, it's more like four and a half million if you take the ancestors of humans as well. We came down from the trees about five million years ago and started living almost entirely on animals about four and a half ago, basically. That's what the anthropology tells us. Um, so when keto was kind of rediscovered, it was about 27 years ago, and I came across it because some colleagues were doing some of the early work on it and looking into it and saying, of course, they were looking at it from the point of view of looking for the reasons why this was going to kill us all. Of course, they were. And I looked at it and went, you know what, that makes sense to me. I'm going to do that just to prove these others wrong. Um, so I did, and I got some vast improvements in a number of idiopathic situations that were going on for me throughout my life prior to that. So we're talking in my mid-twenties is when all of this was. I had, by the time I was 25, I had experienced diverticular disease, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, irritable bowel syndrome, um, some obstructive conditions were going on as well. I had ulcerative colitis. I had gastric reflux. I was not a well puppy at all. Yeah, mental health, track. mental health as well. Dreadful mental health. And doesn't like carbs. So I, I took all the carbs and all the fiber and all the plant-based toxins and all the nonsense out of my diet. And I was basically eating a fairly relaxed, fairly dirty keto diet for a few years before I started to really think, well, hang on. My health is a, about 80% better than it was. Um, so I just kept doing it for another 20 years. And then about seven years ago was when the whole carnival thing re-emerged on the scene, largely because of the Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, Michaela Peterson thing. That also made perfect sense to me. I looked into it to see whether the, the inferences that they were talking about were sound and whether or not there was any real risk involved in not consuming any carbohydrates at all. I already knew there wasn't. Fiber concerned me up front. I thought, oh, perhaps there is a need for fiber, though. It turns out there isn't. Not one gram ever in human beings. And then I was like, okay, vitamin C. Well, why, why is the need for vitamin C so much lower in, in carnivals? I wanted to know. I found the answer. It's because the transporter for vitamin C is GLUT4. That's why. And I just went through systematically answering my own questions. And after about six months of looking into it, I went, you know what? I can't, I can't find a single valid, robust contraindication to 100% carnivore diet. Tell you what, I'm prepared to do N equals one on myself. So I did. As I say, that was about seven and a half years ago. And about four years ago, I gave up my um, professorial engagement, shall we say, on the basis that I wasn't enjoying academia anymore, or the way it was being run, or by whom, shall we say, or the politics. And I was going to go and do my own thing. I was going to set up a, a YouTube channel and talk about nutrition. Well, obviously, I need to talk about carnivore. So that's my run into all of it. Yeah. Yeah, well... Um... There's a, a book uh, recently uh, and um, uh, called The Dietitian's Dilemma, mm. where Michelle Hearn had a, a young, traditionally trained, re registered dietitian was very sick and <laughs> fixed herself. I think it's like Jordan Peterson's story, where mm. she just did carnivore and she got out of bed and, and now is back to normal. And uh, and so she writes the book about the dietitian's dilemma. Uh, we've been taught that this is not good, and yet it saved me. So, so there's this uh, still a, a lack of training mm -hmm. in traditional dietitian uh, programs. Um, it's funny because I, I had a patient in my own area that I couldn't help, and she showed up in this book as someone with this transformation story with uh, changes to really just not eating any plants. And uh, the, I know it's kind of funny, but think that I just can't, it was one of the things that I can't get out of my mind, and that is plants can't run from you. You know, the, mm -hmm. their only defense really is to put toxins in the leaves so that mammals, when they bumble upon them, if they eat them, they'll get ill and they'll say, I don't want to eat that thing. Yeah. So, you know, you think that 
make the berries sweet, so the, the seed gets put around everywhere, but the, the leaves themselves should contain something harmful. Uh, and then you know, why, why humans like to eat peppers that are hot, that, that really would deter any other organism from eating the plant, you know? So anyway, there are all sorts of uh, uh, kind of face validity or, or kind of, you know, reasons why eating plants would not be such a great thing unless they're diluted out. Like, I guess the story of the tomato is that it was a toxin, but then genetically was just cross bred enough. Yeah. So now it's not toxic, yeah. but, but apparently it can cause arthritis pain, the, the uh, uh, nightshade vegetables I'll, I'll pull out for someone who's, who's really, even with a low carb diet eating vegetables, if they're still having lots of joint pains, I'll say, well, you want to drop those nightshades. And of course the carnivore diet would do that from the get go. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, yeah, it's interesting. Has there been any really kind of antagonistic pushback against carnivore other I, the way I see it oh, constantly it, constantly and without little hindrance and it goes on to this day despite the fact that nobody has ever brought any empirical evidence to the table that it's contraindicated for any reason they'll still have a crack at me because the people that are having these cracks and it's not just me it's it's that they're pushing against the whole idea whoever's espousing it the fact of the matter is that they are ideologically underpinned they are, I mean, you spoke about the, the dietetics training there briefly, and I'll say what Eric didn't say, because I've got, you know, nobody to answer to anymore. I can say what I want. Dietetic training is pseudoscientific, ideologically based, based claptrap. Those people that, that come out of dietetics schooling are misinformed ideologically and if you trace the money behind the the dietetics association a lot of it comes from loma linda yeah okay which seventh seventh day haven't that's right the same people that we were talking about before that make up stories about what they found in, in research projects and publish a fantasy that they made up adjusted data sets for example those people the people who believe god told them not to eat meat okay whatever that's the kind of people that actually own outright pretty much the dietetics associations and and everything that they do. Um, so it, it's it's always easy to teach someone how to propagandize, to teach someone what words to say, what phrases to use to win an argument with a person who doesn't have the wherewithal to push back. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing here on my channel. That's why I'm using a confrontational, abrasive, let's face it, very, very sweary approach to dealing with these charlatans, very, very abusive from me. People are saying, you can't possibly be a real genuine ex-professor because you would never behave that way online. I'm doing it as a hook because people do not want to be educated. I've got another channel where it's all collar and tie, all science, no abuse of anybody, no calling anyone a charlatan, no swearing at anyone. Nobody watches it, Eric. They don't care about science. They want to be shocked. They want to be offended. They want to yeah. be amused or some combination of that. They want to, they want to um, react emotionally one way or the, or the other to what they're hearing. And the YouTube algorithm, algorithm, also demands that to be successful on YouTube, you have to get people to respond to you emotionally, viscerally, anything but logically, and oh yes, he's right about the science. So that's why I do what I do. That's that's why I do it the way I do it here. And because I'm retired permanently from ever wanting to hold another academic position in my life, I've got nobody to answer to and no reputation to uphold anymore. I'm done with it. I will not go back to academia. It's become progressive and woke to the level that I can't stomach, frankly. So, um, yeah, as long as I can ride that line of what you can, I'm right up to the line of what you can and can't say most of the time, sometimes over it, according to the YouTube police, but that's for another day. Um, yeah, we, but, but yes, the, I mean, the question that, was about pushback and yeah, there is a lot of it. Yeah. I, well, I, I support what you're doing and 
I have to just acknowledge that academia in terms of diet is way behind what uh, what people are doing out in the real world, so to speak. So you know, there's the old way of saying the ivory tower and, and the out in the real world. <laughs> the, the ivory tower, our NIH US uh, consensus came up with something called the DASH diet. Yeah. And, and they taught it through, you know, I think hundreds of programs and all that. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and, um, and it doesn't lead to weight loss. And, and yet I'll, I'll have people say, well, I would put them on the DASH diet because it's the only thing they've heard of. And it was a diet by consensus, which means, you know, you got to appeal and appease this person, this person, all that. And it doesn't work for weight loss. Maybe it helps blood pressure a little bit, mm -hmm. but, um, Academia puts so much into these kind of consensus view of the of using an old paradigm that they would probably laugh carnivore study out, you know, it's unethical, it would kill you, you know, which is not really a very scientific approach. <laughs> if something interesting and there's pilot data about it, that's where we ought to be mm -hmm. researching. And so um academia seems to me is is in collusion with the pharma mechanistic model of, so what I see, my colleagues, they might know that I can reverse diabetes with lifestyle and a keto diet. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. They, they want to find the little, little switch that will fix diabetes regardless of what people eat, mm -hmm. you know? So, so they're, it's just a different focus. Yeah. So, so I mean, you know, one researcher I met through the years had a primate colony. It, it's expensive and there aren't many of them. And he used the American diet to cause atherosclerosis. Yeah. And, and he looked at the mechanism and I said, well, that's interesting. Did you try the primates on a keto diet and maybe they didn't get atherosclerosis? And he said, no, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. The point is I wanted to create atherosclerosis so I could study the mechanism. Yeah. And then give a drug to prevent the mechanism. That's right. There has to be something that you can sell at the end of it for money. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, or, and, and or, something that people have to keep taking so that they're behooven to that structure, etc. Professor Eric Westman, it's been an absolute pleasure. We're just over an hour and I want to be respectful of your time. I want to thank you very much for sharing time. your knowledge and experience with us. Yes, indeed, it is. Um, Perhaps we can continue to talk in the background over the coming months and potentially years uh, about various things, including that letter, but we should probably get together about that Loma Linda study, for example. Um, and perhaps, you know, over time, you'll come fully to the dark side here. Let me complete your training and, and we'll get you to be a 100% carnivore and stop telling people even that it's a good idea at all to be consuming any fiber or green things or any of that kind of stuff. I don't know. But let's finish with this just for fun. Go, oh, sorry, you wanted to say? I'm a big fan of the Matrix. Excellent. I assume the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you could just kind of plug me in. Yep. Yeah. Right. And teach me everything you know. All right. So you want uh, you want the blue pill is what you're saying? Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's finish with this just for fun. Um, we've talked about what science actually is and what science actually isn't, and there are a lot of people running around claiming to be scientists who actually do have some credence, some credentials behind them, but not actually any competence because what they're saying is ideologically based and demonstrably false and not underpinned by empirical evidence, which is what science is. But just for fun, let's finish off with what do you think of people who run around claiming to have a credential or a skill set that they actually don't. I'll give you an example. There's a bloke running around calling himself Dr. Such and Such, MD. He passed his final exams. Yes. He did never start even his residency anywhere. He's never done a day's work as a physician in his life and never will because he hasn't even done his residency or even started it. He finished his finals, passed his exams, and now he's an internet promoter of veganism, calling himself Dr. Such and Such, comma, MD. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's a stretch, isn't it? Mm. Uh, it's, um, 
And we're talking about this guy, the one who says, if you don't eat your fruits and vegetables, you might die. That one. That's who we're talking about. I don't know who you're talking about, but um, that it's, it's a stretch and it is unfortunate. And, um, you know, you just have to be careful and the information that you consume. And, and I'm reminded of an old movie where, you know, you, the Flim Flam man came to town and the mayor said, I want the credentials. I want, I want to see his credentials. You know, and when they finally looked in the old book, the paper had been that year was ripped out, so they couldn't. He ripped out, so they couldn't verify that he really hadn't graduated from that that year. But yeah, the people getting a degree and then kind of standing on that to to just say what they were going to say anyway is um, well, is it fraudulent? I don't know. It's a stretch. He's legally able to call himself such and doctor such and such MD. There's no illegality in so doing. But I, I think you described it well when you said it's a stretch. Obviously, being a free to say what I want kind of individual, I'd go a bit further and say, yeah, it's disingenuous at least, if not misrepresentation at worst, which is always a bad thing. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd get your thoughts on that. Thanks for that. And thanks for your valuable time. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, as I said, and your experience in the fields of both medicine and nutrition research. That was a, a very, very important um I guess, perspective that, that my people can hear and they thank you for it um, through me. Tell us where we find all your various social media things, what you're doing, tell us about where to find you, all of that, and that'll that'll wind us up. Yeah, you know, my day job really is at Duke University. You can see me as a patient, but there's a bit of a wait. <laughs> so for people who can't come to Duke, I have a website. It's ericwestmanmd.com. And it gets you to the latest information. We have a list of foods for a small fee. We have classes you can take. There are books you can purchase at Amazon. My latest book, End Your Carb Confusion, talks about different levels of carbs. Um, and then we got a cookbook written by, I think, the first Michelin star level rated chef to put his mind to a low carb cookbook. It, it's excellent. Um, and then Adapt Your Life is my company, Adapt Your Life Academy, has classes that you can take for those who can't make it to, to here because our philosophy and we actually have other people writing classes at the Adapt Your Life Academy, including type one diabetes, uh, including sugar addiction, all these interesting topics related to health. That's adapteryourlifeacademy.com. Brilliant. And did you want to promote any of the YouTube channels or other social media sites of that kind? Sure. So the Adapt Your Life YouTube channel as well. So it's really that's the name to look for at, at Facebook. At, um, my Twitter is at Eric, Dr. Eric Westman. And uh, so it's either Eric Westman, MD, Dr. Eric Westman, or Adapt Your Life. Uh, those are the places to look. And gosh, we have hundreds of videos now at the Adapt Your Life YouTube channel if you're a YouTuber. Excellent. Awesome. All right, Professor Dr. Eric Westman, thank you very much for your time. That was brilliant. And I do hope that we can talk again soon about some other aspect yeah. of something. Yeah, thank you so much.